Let me start. So I'm Nikolai Palok. I'm a Java developer advocate for Oracle. And I'm here to talk to you about Java Next, meaning what comes next for Java, about the four big projects, Amber, Loom, Panama, and Valhalla. The slides are already online. You go to slides.nipafx.dev, and on the right-hand side, you will see the talk Java Next. And then you can follow along on your device if you want to, if I'm too fast or too slow. Probably going to be too fast, because there's a lot of content, uh, Project Valhalla specifically, Somebody once joked that this is like six PhD theses in one, in one project. So doing quick math, that means 24 PhD theses in 48 minutes left. So we've got to be quick. If I don't get around to your questions, don't worry. I'll be here for the rest of the day. Just catch me on stage after the talk is done, because there is some time left or in the hallway anywhere. If I don't get to your questions here, please still ask them. I will also show a Twitter link later. So we're going to talk about those four projects. What are they? Uh, so Java is developed in the OpenJDK community, and uh, the development process there is that for large ideas and large feature sets, so-called projects are founded, and they work on these over time. And these are the four, at the moment, most important and most relevant ones. So that's why I'm going to take you through all four of those. As I said, we're a little like, pressured on time, so let's just dive right in. Let's talk about Project Amber. And the slogan is that it's going to have a smaller productivity-oriented Java language features. Everything that's green is a link, so if the slide's in front of you, you can see links to the wiki, to the mailing lists, uh, to all of that there, so you can follow up on that if you're interested. The motivation behind Project Amber is that some of the downsides that Java has that are related to um, it, that it's a little bit cumbersome, that it's a little bit verbose, that those can be overcome by introducing new, usually relatively small language features. And the important thing to understand is that Amber is not so much a solution to a problem in classic Java, Java pattern, it's more like a solution factory. It's going to just create, it's going to continuously look for places that need improvement and produce the solutions for those improvements. It already delivered a bunch of stuff, sealed types, records, type patterns, uh, text blocks, switch expressions, and all of those have been talked about already by my colleague um, Billy yesterday, but in case you're too lazy to build a time machine just to see that, there's also a talk in 111 right after this talk uh, in the next slot. And uh, the presenter, I forgot his name right now, also talks about Java 11 to 17, so I guess you will see some of those things in there as well. So if you're interested in details on that, we're not going to look at that here, because I could talk about pattern matching a whole lot, because many of these features do relate to pattern matching, and that would be super interesting, which is why I made a video about that. So you can watch that, and we're going to skip that, and I brought you something else that's also very interesting and not quite that well known yet. So let's talk about string composition. We can compose string in strings in Java, of course. So what I'm doing here is I'm creating an SQL statement, a select statement, and the idea is that the property that I want to select on um, and the value of that property that I want to put them into the string. So what I do here is two different ways to do this. I can just use the plus operator, or I can use string formatting. It does its job. It's a bit verbose, and it comes with the free SQL injection, but it does the job, right? Like, it, you know, you, put, you get the thing that you want. Um, this would be great, though, right? So something like this, uh, where you have some way to embed the property and value variables straight into the string. Uh, you're going to see later why I use this strange uh, syntax with a backslash, but in JavaScript, for example, just a dollar sign. And that's cool. Now you can do, like, the, 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 now you can do the thing much faster and get your SQL injections much faster. So yay, I guess. Um, because the thing is about string interpolation that you're usually not just creating human readable strings. It's not about you know, plotting the names of the characters into a story that you're writing in Java that then you know, your, your, the, your colleagues can read in source code or on the printed uh, console or whatever. That's not what this is about. Usually you create structured text, whether it's HTML, JSON, YAML, TOML, whatever. You're creating not a human, not, not a text that's not first addressed at, at humans, but probably at machines. And all of these have format-specific rules. All of these have properties that you want to uphold, something that you want to validate. And this is where string templates come in. This is a JEP draft at the moment. So this could change a whole lot. It might never appear. If we're lucky, we could see already something as a preview in 20, in Java 20, but then we have to get really lucky. So this can all change, right? We're looking into the future now, and that's always difficult. Um, but the idea here would be, that you could write something like this. You see the backslash popping up again. I'm just using a text block here, by the way. Um, that's unrelated. You can use a text block. You can use like a single line string. Doesn't matter. Um, the important part here is that, first of all, I embed variables here. And the reason why the current proposal considers using the backslash um, and then the curly brace is because that's, at the moment, an illegal escape sequence. 
So there can never be an issue with something that was legal in the past, doesn't, or isn't legal anymore, or something that you cannot copy-paste. So it's just like this is um, this variable, so this, this syntax would not be legal in the current string. So we're embedding this here. And what we get here is a templated string. But there's something else. There's a template policy, the str there. So there are two steps. There's not just like put the variables in the string. No, there is put the variables in the string, and then you get a templated string, and then the policy turns that into an actual string, not the asterisk. We'll get to that. Okay, so one policy could be, you know, just, just put those things together, just concatenate the strings. Very easily, we have something here. We have a description variable and a price variable and quantity variable. All of those are apparently, you know, defined somewhere up uh, in the code there. And then we create, uh, create something that looks like a little payment slip, where we compute uh, well, a description here that was the hammer and, you know, just like some simple math uh, that's embedded here, right? So you can embed expressions, not just variables. And it gives you that, it's just by concatenating the results of those expressions. That's pretty neat. But the astute among you may notice that you cannot actually pay this amount of money. It's really hard to go like below a cent. Um, so there could be another policy that could understand all of these formatter strings, right? The ones that use for string.format. Uh, so now you could, I, I have no idea by heart how these work, but this, I think, dot two means give me two uh, positions after the decimal point. And then there's some rounding involved, of course. And hey, this looks better. This looks like an actual payment slip. And this would be a different policy that gets the same input but produces a different output. OK, but why do we just focus on strings? As I mentioned earlier, we're usually not mainly interested in having strings there to be read by other humans. Usually, we have strings there to be read by machines. So we start with the idea that we have like a string that has to have some values in there. Then we put all the strings in there. We potentially sanitize or validate that. And then we parse that back. We turn like the stupid string that we just created and parse it back into a more complex representation. In this case, maybe a statement, a JSON object, whatever. Why do we go to the detour? Well, we start, why do we start with strings and variables, then make it something less expressive, the string, and then turn it back up into an actual um, domain object? And it turns out that that is not at all necessary. So the templating policy, that's the interface that a templating policy would have to implement. It takes a templated string, but the result is a generic type. It can be anything. It doesn't have to be a string. So the templating policy could actually do something smarter. So for example, there could be a templating policy like this. Ask you like, how, how exactly that call works, like how this, this does not make sense at the moment in Java, right? Ignore that part, it's not important. You can read the JEP, I'll link to it later, um, and then you can read up on that. But that means like, I could use an SQL templating policy, and then that thing knows about SQL. That's what it's written for. It's written to make sure that everything's escaped, that it's a proper statement, that it's, it can validate and all, do all of that, and then it can give you back a statement, like an SQL statement. It doesn't have to go like, here's your string, parse it later. It can do that in one go. It can validate and parse and gives you back a statement. Same if you want to do JSON. You can get a JSON object back if you want to. And so that means that we can provide our own templating mechanisms that take in a templated string and return whatever representation we feel is like the best result for this. It doesn't have to be a string, but it can also include all the domain ru uh, domain specific rules that are included here. I think that's, that's really cool. Uh, that's something that's very, very interesting. But as I mentioned, it's in an early stage. So we're not sure whether it looks exactly like this or it will even come. Um, I'll link to the JEP draft here. So when the JEPs, so the JDK enhancement proposals, that is, when they are still drafts, they don't have a real number. They have like a six or seven digit ticket number. So that's too long to memorize. So that's why I don't give you these. You have to actually click the link to see where this goes. Whereas everything that's a little bit more mature, those JDK enhanced proposals do have numbers. Um, and there are some things. Uh, that are currently going on in Amber here, which is to finish pattern matching. Um, that is currently uh, in its third preview in Java 19. And then there's the idea to add more patterns. There's the thought about concise method bodies, which is my method really does something very simple. It just calls that other method. Why do I have to write like curly brace open and then the other method name and then curly brace close? Maybe I could just write arrow and then the other method name, something like that. So there's, that's an idea that's floating around. And maybe the whole serialization mechanism will get a big revamp, which it direly needs, but which, of course, is a very complex topic to tackle. So there's just a white paper even, so that's even earlier. So there are all different ideas floating around in Amber. These are not even all of them. There we go. So Project Amber wants to make Java more expressive, wants to reduce the amount of code that we have to write, and wants to make us more productive um, um, by, the, by doing that. And the idea here is that 
some of the things are already done in JDK 19, so deconstruction patterns will preview. But the rest of those things, and it's very important to understand, are my personal guesses. Not the top line with the many uh, exclamation parts, right? points. I do work for Oracle, but this does not represent an Oracle promise that this will happen. I don't even ask the people working on this what their plans and timelines are, because either they give me the good answer, which is, we don't know. It's done when it's done. Or they give me some internal information that then I can't share, so that's stupid. So I don't ask. I'm judging these things based on the mailing lists, on the jabs, on, the, on some experience. So this could be all wrong, but so far I think I've, some of the things I guessed were at least like close to the truth. So JDK 19 will contain deconstruction patterns as a preview, which takes records apart into its individual pieces. And then I hope that next year that patterns in Switch will, will, will be finalized so we can have like full pattern matching in Java as a standard feature, not just as a preview. I hope that template strings will preview. And I'm sure that there are more pattern plans. I know there are more pattern, pattern plans in the pipeline, and I hope that by 2024 maybe uh, that they will mature enough to preview. So you can see this is already like you know, two years or at least, and there are more ideas that are presented earlier that are not on here that are even further in the future. So Project Amber will not be done by 2025. This will surely go on for at least most of this decade, I would assume. If you're interested in any of these topics, there are lots of links to deeper dives here. That's always at the end of each of these projects. Um, so if you read one of these sections, you're like, That's, that looks so cool, I want to learn more about that. At the end, there's a chance for you to find some interesting links. So let's talk about something completely different now. Let's take a breath and a sip of water. And let's talk about Project Panama. Uh, so Project Panama is about interconnecting um, the JVM with native code. Once again, here are all the links. And this project already runs for eight years and um, is at the moment led by Mauricio Chimadamore. And it like, falls apart into three sub-projects, the Vector API, the Foreign Memory API, and the Foreign Function API, although the latter two are related. So let's talk about each of these at least a bit. Let's start with the Vector API. And for that, we have to take a step back and talk about vectorization in general. So let's say you have two float arrays, A and B. And what you want to consume, uh, sorry, what you want to compute is, a, is an array C, which also contains floats, and you know, has this computation, A squared plus B squared, and then the negative of that, that's what you want to have in C. So the, you know, the, the, the straightforward way to write that is pretty easy. I mean, you have to check whether all the arrays have the same length, but we're going to assume that that's the case. Uh, you just take, if you just iterate over one of these, uh, I mean, you use one of them for the iteration length, for the loop length, and then you take, you know, A, of a uh, at the position i squared, B at the position i squared, multiply by minus one, and there you go. And that's the result, and that's great. So there's an issue with that, though. Um, modern CPUs don't have to do this one pair of numbers at a time. So this laptop here has a multi-word register of 512 bits. What that means, not just one, more of those. What that means is you can load 512 by 32, I'm not sure, what is the number, 16, I think. So you can load 16 floats into one of these registers, 16 floats into another of these registers, and then add them, for example, or multiply them, and get 16 results. And the amount of time it takes the CPU to do that is about the same amount of time it takes it to do just a single additional multiplication. So you just have like a 16 times speed up there, potentially. And that's huge, right? So that, that, that's big. That's like, I think the, the older among you may remember the Intel MMX extension. That was that kind of stuff, right? That's a lot what happens like with image processing and everything. Um, so that's why that was important. And still is important. Um, and the just-in-time compiler knows about this. The just-in-time compiler tries to hit that. It tries to figure out the loop that I'm doing here. Would this loop fit into these multi-word registers? And if it does figure it out and it does it, it can give you the speed up. The issue with that is, that by, that's called auto-vectorization, by the way. So auto-vectorization is that the just-in-time compiler figures out that it can use these specific CPU registers to make your code run faster. But it doesn't do that reliably. So it's, it's a nice performance boost if you get it, but you cannot rely on that definitely being the case. And this is where the vector API comes in. The vector API tries to, not tries to, achieves to give you an API that will always compile to that kind of code. And of course, it makes the whole thing a little more complicated. But the important part, and I'm, not, I'm going to skip past what a species is, um, the important part st is still in this loop here, where we go not in steps of one, but in steps of the species length. So let's imagine that's like the 32 that I mentioned on the, on the or 16 that I mentioned on the last slide. So we go in steps lengths of 16, and then we take 16 values out of array A and put that into a vector A, 
and then 16 floats out of vector b and to put that into vector b, and then we have to do the cool thing that big integer also does, which is like write out math in method calls. Uh, so we go a times a and then add b times b and then the negative of that, so that's the same math. And then we write that into the result array. So yes, it's not as comfortable as a regular loop. It's about like, what, five times the amount of code? Um, but it reliably compiles down to that kind of code. So you can write this. It's comparatively clear and concise, I mean, specifically given the requirements. And it works on all platforms. Whether you, This one has 512 bits, as I mentioned. My Ryzen at home has 256 bits. This API doesn't care. Like It does the right thing at just-in-time compilation. It figures out what's the right thing for your CPU, and it will just do it. Um, uh, and it will always hit this, right? It's not just maybe. No, it will always uh, figure this out and give you good performance. And even if you're running on a very old uh, CPU that doesn't even have this on a, like, on a lim very limited um, hardware, it will still give you the same performance as the regular loop at the beginning. So it will never, it will never be worse. So that's pretty great. That's not something that um, a lot of us are going to use day in, day out. But if you do something like image processing, then the library you're using will probably use that. So anything that's heavy on arithmetic, like maybe machine learning, all of those can benefit from this. OK, now we're switching from vector API to these foreign APIs. And I'm going to stay on a much higher level of, uh, of, of abstraction here, because this deals with like native code, and I don't know a lot about that. So I'm just going to be somewhat vague. So it's, this is about two things. This is about, first, taking data that is usually in your heap that your garbage collector manages and parking it off heap. Some, one reason could be because you think you can do better than the garbage collector. Good luck with that. Another is that you know very, a lot about the domain and uh, have very good reason to believe that, and that could work out. Or another one is you want to call native code, which is the second part of this. You want to call a native C function or a native uh, machine learning library. So you first have to shuffle your data somewhere where the garbage collector will move it around and then call that native function. And the issue with that is that none of these are great. There's always like trade-offs. So for example, uh, restoring stuff off heap, you can use the byte buffer, which is limited and not very fast, but at least it's safe. Or you can use unsafe, which is not safe, uh, and not supported. So that's not great. So you have to make this tough choice between eh and eh. Um, and then JNI also isn't great. Like gives you a lot of tool chains that you have to interact with, a lot of manual plumbing that you have to do. This works reasonably well. I mean, people are using this, but I think nobody who uses this is doing this with a lot of passion. So there are two new APIs being proposed. One of them is the foreign memory API, dealing with a safe and performant way to store stuff off heap. It gives you not just like one class, byte buffer, and then hopes that it does all the right things. No, it gives you a bunch of classes that uh, you can deal with. And a very interesting aspect of that is, is the memory session. Um, that gives you a way to deallocate the off-heap memory. Because the one, is one issue with byte buffer is, is that if you store something off-heap, then the garbage collector doesn't know how much that is. So you have like a byte buffer instance in your, in your heap, which is like a couple of bytes large. It points off-heap and has like two gigabytes of off-heap memory. And the garbage collector, when shuffling data around, like some of them at least, they go by, by importance space, by relevance. And they're like, well, that byte buffer, byte buffer is super small. We're not going to clean that up. We can do that later. And so you have these two gigabytes there lying around until finally the garbage collector gets around to cleaning the byte buffer. And the memory session gives you an actual API to be like, I don't need this memory anymore. You can also handle uh, and configure, do I need concurrent access to this? Because concurrent access to off-heap memory is tricky, specifically when you start shutting that down. Often you don't need that, so you don't want to pay for this. And so this API gives you all the details that you need to figure out what do I need in this situation, and then make sure that you get that kind of, of behavior and then the optimum performance at that. And the foreign function API does a similar thing. Like Instead of leaving you with, uh, with an over, overly simplified uh, approach, it gives you a little bit more detail, a little more, more methods to, and classes to work with that you have to work with. Um, basically, the idea is that it uses method handles to call into native code. And the very important uh, keystone here is jextract. So jextract is, is a tool, a command line tool, that will run over a, a, native, a native library, a C file, for example, and it will create the Java file that calls all of these methods with the method handles. That's super low level. That's an API that you probably don't want to use as is. So the idea is that you write um, an additional API on top of that. So you write your own API that you actually do want to use against this automatically generated file. And then when the C library updates, you rerun jextract, you get the new low-level version of that API, and then your code, 
either, either still compiles against it and you're hoping that there were no you know, backwards incompatible changes that you'd missed, but more likely if there were changes, if the API did change, then you will get compile errors in your code. And that's good, right? Because then you can use that uh, to fix um, your API you wrote on top of that. So if you're dealing with off heap memory or native calls, look into the foreign function for memory APIs. This timeline does not contain any personal guesses. This is the actual timeline. So on JDK 19, uh, the foreign function memory API APIs preview as one. That's JEP 422. That's the first preview. They have been incubation independently of one another for a while. And now they're at a point where uh, they are start to, you know, to, to mature. So they will be, so they're both previewing and they're definitely ready to be experimented with. So if that's something that you do, do an experiment with them and uh, report back how it works for you. The vector API is a little bit on, it's a little bit you know, in a weird situation because it is really pr uh, mature. It has pre, uh, sorry, incubated, I think, for like four releases or something now, and it works pretty well. The issue is that it needs Valhalla's primitive types and universal generics. And if you don't know what that is, don't worry, we're going to come to that next. But the thing is, it needs something that is still in development. And that's why it's going to wait for Valhalla, because if it finalizes now, the API will not be as good as it could be maybe in two or three years. So that's unfortunate because it's like it's done, but it's not finalized yet because it has to wait for this. So yeah, it's a little bit in this in-between space. Again, there are deeper dives. One thing I can recommend is a FISBUS SIMD style from Gunnar Morling, where you use the vector API uh, to write FISBUS. That's a very in, uh, instructive blog post that I can only recommend to have a look at. And then there's a ton of stuff on the foreign APIs. These state of um, articles, you can find those. Those are usually written by the people working on the project. Those are great. So state of foreign memory and state of foreign function support are great articles to read up uh, to get a better impression of how this works. OK, now let's get to Project Valhalla, which I just teased. This is about advanced Java VM and language feature candidates, which tells you nothing. So we, it's a little bit weird of a claim. Um, you can see that it ran for a long time. And that's the project that somebody, I think might even be, have been John Rose, told Brian Getz, who is one of the leader of this project, uh, this is going to be six PhD theses rolled into one Java feature. Uh, so that's, that's a lot of work. And they've been at it for eight years. And there are great talks by Brian from various conferences where he went over different iterations and evolutions and describes this and that. And a lot of that is like dealing with JVM internals, which is a little bit beyond me. So uh, I'm not claiming to understand all of them, but they are interesting to listen to. And if you understand more of the JVM internals, even more so. Okay, so what is Valhalla about? The issue with Java, one of the issues with Java is, um, probably a pretty big one, is that it has a split type system. It has primitives on the one end and classes on the other end. And pretty much whatever way you have to separate these, they're like on the opposite ends of that. So one of them are always by reference, the other always by value. One of them is something that we can create, the others we cannot create. One of them you can use generics with, the other one you cannot use generics with. So like super opposite ends of this. And uh, the only thing that we can do is create classes. And all classes have two specific properties that can bite us. So they have identity and they are references. So what does it mean? So all classes come with identity. And that they have an identity means, for example, let's say you have an int 5, and you have another int 5. Are these? They are equal, of course. But are they the same int 5? The question doesn't even make sense. Of course, how, yes, they're both 5. How could they not be the same? But if you write new integer 5 and new integer 5, they're also equal. They actually have an equals method that checks that, but they're not the same. If you compare with the equal signs, then you will get a false. And the reason for that is that they have an identity. It's not just the value that they have that makes them a thing. They also have like an extra identity. Um, and you need that extra identity if you want to mutate stuff. You cannot mutate, mutate integer, fortunately, but you know, you could come up with a mutable integer where you can call set five on, you know, maybe think about atomic integer, and you say, sorry, you can call set six on, and then you change the five to a six. And it only works if that thing has an identity. So identity and mutability are bound together. Um, but this identity is, uh, comes with extra memory because the JVM has to track this. And it's also something that gives you the ability to lock on that stuff, to synchronize on that stuff, to do a bunch of identity-specific operations. And in general, that's good. We make use of that. You know, we can all laugh about mutability, and that's a bad idea, and we can have a whole talk like the one before this that gives us thoughts about how to pre you know, avoid it because it gives us issues. But in general, it would be, it's good to have in a Java program at least the chance to mutate some variables. I agree. I would at least like go that far. Um, so it's not like this is overall a bad idea to have this. It's just not all classes need it. 
but all classes pay for it. Every type we create has this extra memory. Every class we create, somebody can use as a lock. And then they also come as with references. So the references is the thing, right? You have an int array, and you have like an array, which is like the numbers, the int numbers. But you have an integer array. What you have is an array of pointers that point all the way over memory, um, which is not good. It takes a long time to track these down. You probably don't get a lot of ca cache hits. So it's not ideal um, that you have always have this indirection there. This also gives you nullability. Once again, I'm not a friend of it. I work hard to avoid it, but it's not a thing that I think we can like generally not use anymore. So it's good that we have nullability, but it's not ideal that we have to have it all the time, that all classes are always nullable. And I'm not going to talk about tearing here, so let's ignore that. It's going to show up on another slide, uh, but in the interest of time, let's skip that. And again, not all custom types need that. So in comes Project Valhalla and says, look, we're going to do things a little bit different here from now on. Yes, primitives on the one end and classes on the other hand with the identity and the references and all, but we're going to create types in between. We're going to create value types, or you know, we as developers, we're going to have the chance to create value types with do not have an identity. They say value types means I don't care about identity, or you can go one step further and can say, I'm creating a primitive type, I don't need identity, and I don't need references. So those are two important parts of Project Valhalla. And then come two parts that deal with generics. And that's universal generics, meaning you can use primitives and value types and even primitive types, all of those you can use in generics. And then specialized generics will give you a way that an array list of int is actually backed by an int array. We're going to come to that in a second. Let's start with value types. So the idea here is that you just have a new keyword value, or probably it's like one of these reserved special keywords, so you can probably set up variables of the name value. Um, so you just write value here in front of class, you just write what looks like a regular class, you give it fields and whatever, um, you implement interfaces, you can do like a regular class. There are some exceptions, and one of them is that the class and fields are implicitly final, so this, you cannot reassign the nominator and the denominator here, and that the superclasses are limited, so you cannot just implement any superclass. Rule of thumb is you can implement almost no superclass, but there are few, a few superclasses that, you, that actually work because they, have very sp they fulfill very specific requirements too detailed to go into here. So, the so these, as I said, value types don't have behavior. Uh, sorry, don't have, well, they do have behavior. They don't have identity. Um, you know, just to use my uh, mistake here regarding behavior. They can implement interfaces, for example. They can have methods, so they can, like, you can use regular class building techniques here, right? Like, you can do all the cool stuff that you would use with classes, except for these few things. Okay, so they don't have identity, and that means some runtime operations don't work. Like, for example, locking on them, because to lock on them, you need to know their identity, and the JVM doesn't check the identity of these, so you will get an exception. And if you do the identity check with the two equal signs, that wouldn't make sense. So it's like comparing two ints. To, you know, so what it would do is it would say, okay, let's compare the values that they have. So they compare the state of the fields instead of, um, of comparing the identity that these expressively don't had, have. The benefits you get from that is, without identity, you can't have mutability, so these are all guaranteed immutable. It's not like almost immutable, like final fields. These are like, nope, the JVM knows these can never be changed, so you can optimize much more aggressively. You can more expressively write your code. You can communicate to your coworkers and uh, to other people in your community that this is a value. So for example, think about domain-driven design where that term actually has a meaning, and now you don't have to maybe like use Lombok or write a comment at the top and be like, I hope this is a value, please don't change too many things so it isn't anymore. Now you can just write a value class and it is a value. And as I mentioned, it gives the JVM more chances to optimize, so it will make code faster compared to using a regular class. Um, but they still have references, right? So they still have null as a default value, and the JVM still protects you from tearing. So the JDK, as well as other libraries, uh, has many value-based classes, such as optional and local daytime. And we, talking about uh, the, JD, uh, the, the Java platform, Google Oracle, or the Open JDK community as a whole, we plan to migrate many value-based classes in the JDK to value classes. So optional, local daytime, all of those could become, hopefully become, value types. Now you might think, like, wait a moment, didn't I say earlier that you will get a runtime exception when you lock on them? Isn't that backwards incompatible change? So if you look at the Java doc of these classes specifically, they will say, like usually at the very bottom of the Java doc, this is a value-based class. And that's a link to a Java doc page that explains 
that there's a ton of things that you're not supposed to do with value-based classes, specifically uh, including optional and local date time, like locking, for example. So uh, this is already safeguarded against since Java 8, because back then Brian had, a, had some other concept of what this might look like, uh, so there are some safeguards put into place. So uh, now is a good time to learn about value-based classes and make sure that your code doesn't do anything it shouldn't. Although, like, it's not that easy to violate those rules with optional, like why would you synchronize an optional, for example. Um, so, but still, you know, give it a go. Let's come to the next thing, primitive types. You just write primitive instead of value. And then you basically get, like, get the value class. One exception is that you cannot reference your own type. Well, for a complex number, that wouldn't make a lot of sense, but think of a node in a linked list. And that node, if it's a primitive class, it needs to reference, well, whatever. If it's a class, it needs to reference like the next node, right? That's how that works. Um, but it cannot reference, so it references a field of its own type. And with primitive types, that does not work. We'll probably not get to the counter to that, but the reason for that I can explain. The reason is that primitive types are no references, right? So they have no identity like value types, but there also are no references. That means the JVM has the freedom to always, instead of having like a complex number, which is two longs, uh, instead of like shuffling or two doubles or whatever it was, so instead of like giving a class around a pointer to a class that somewhere has like two doubles in memory, it can, it doesn't have to, it can just pass around the two doubles. And that means it needs to know how much, mem how much space to reserve for that. And if that node can reference itself, like it wouldn't know, like that, that wouldn't make sense, right? So that's, that's the reason why that doesn't work. And also since you, there are no references, they cannot be null, that means that like, you cannot terminate this. So it would, pay, it would be an infinite uh, regression. Anyway, okay, so these are not references. Um, that means they have a def as a default value all fields set to their defaults. So this would have rational and irrational as zero which makes sense, right? That's a good complex number. That's like the zero of complex numbers. That's good. Remember the value type that I showed you earlier? That was um, um, a rational number, which had like a nominator and a denominator. The issue with that is that if the denominator is zero, then you have an illegal number. So the default value for that rational class would be an illegal number that as soon as you add it to something or multiply it to something, all the other computation would end up with NAN, basically. And that's not great. Right, it's like this. So that specific combination of like a nominator and a denominator would not work with zeros as a default value. That's why that one was not a primitive class, because it needs null. Like it just needs null as a reasonable default value. It cannot just be well all zeros and it will be fine. And that's the distinction you will have to make. You will figure out well if this if all zeros work, you know, for numbers or the empty string or whatever. Like if you know if those or null would be uh, the default value for a string, of course. So if all this default value of fields, if those work for me, then you could make it a primitive class most likely. But if it doesn't, if you need like a reasonable default value, then you do want to have a value type so you can use null. Okay, the benefit is that the JVM can go crazy with performance improvements here, and ideally these will get the same, um, same performance as today's primitives which is massive, right? So we can create all kinds of number types that we want. Um, we can do the stuff like complex numbers. Uh, if you do game programming, for example, or other like uh, computation heavy things where you deal like with points in multidimensional space, then you know if I have like an array of points, then that's an array of like pointers that you know then have to go hunt them down and find the X, Y, and Z coordinate, that sucks. So common counter to that is to have like an X coordinate array and a Y coordinate array and a Z coordinate array to, to go over those. So you can use actual like primitives and that works, but it makes the code less maintainable to get better performance. And that's unfortunate, and that's something that value primitive type specifically would totally cancel. Okay, we're gonna skip the boxes, because we won't get to that, uh, we don't have enough time. If we do, we can go back to it afterwards. Otherwise, remember, you can always ask me about this stuff. Okay, so now let's get to the generics. In the past, it was like bearable, All, like, it was bearable that primitive types, or primitives, could not be used in generics. Because there were just eight of them, there were not very rich types. It's like it's just an int. Like we can we can work around that, you know, with clenched teeth, but we can. If everybody starts to create their own value types and primitive types, and they immediately fall apart when they touch generics, that would be a really bad situation. Because then these two language features would basically counter one another. You could just like, do I want generics or do I want primitive types? And that's obviously not a, not a situation that this language can be in. So the idea behind universal generics is that you will be able to use 
every kind of type. The rational number, that was the value class I used earlier, or long, like a classic primitive. You can use all of them in generics. And that's somewhat straightforward. That could even be the case today. That's not the complicated part. The complicated part is specialized generics. The complicated part is where you actually also then want it to do the right thing and not erase all of this to just object. So let's say you have an array list of int. As I said, the language today could already allow that. But the way it's implemented, it would still be an object array in the background. So like that, you would not do that. If you're dealing with ints for performance reasons, you would not want to throw it into an array list of int and then get object arrays back. Um, so that's not something that's, that, that's going to fly. So the goal with specialized generics is that it will do the right thing. It will turn this into an actual int array. And that's, I think, where all those, like, what, what was it, like six PhD theses or whatever? I'm pretty sure that like, the majority are hiding in here. So that's, that's like the big, that's the, the big fish that uh, Project Valhalla needs, needs to catch, figuring out how that can work in a backwards compatible manner and with the performance uh, that we expect. And if all of that works out, we get value types, primitive types, universal and specialized generics, we'll have much fewer trade-offs between the design that we want to create to have maintainable code and the performance that we desire. We don't need to do manual specializations. Few of us do that, but there are libraries for that, right? For example, Eclipse Collections with had like specifically has primitive specializations of like list, which is an int list and a double list and a float list. There is an, uh, an int stream and a long stream and a double stream. And I'm pretty sure the person in charge of writing all of these quit and said like, I'm not gonna do float stream either. I'm just gonna, I'm out of here. Um, because there is no float stream. There is function, but there's also two int function and two long function and whatever. Um, and the reason for that is that at the moment, otherwise, um, generics would break these things and you would always deal with optionals and boxing in between, and we don't want that. But if this works out, then all of these classes um, will basically deprecate themselves because you, a stream of int would be the same thing, the same behavior as an int stream. So that's a good thing. Then within the JDK, and also within our code, we can probably just skip a bunch, a switch a bunch of things to primitives. Not even because we want the performance, but just because it better expresses what we are thinking about here. And that gives us better performance just, just like that. So the better design also gives us better performance there. You can express the design more cleanly, and I hope, this is my personal guess at the bottom here, that once it becomes more common to deal with uh, these immutable types, that we will write more APIs that communicate by sending immutable types back and forth. So if like one subsystem and another subsystem. And I think a big challenge is that when these subsystems share references to mutable objects, that they mutate them independently of one another and one doesn't register, that the change caused a, pro caused a problem. And so that's, I think, is a common, like sharing mutable state is an issue. And if we just get more tools to instead communicate with immutable objects, I think then that will make our APIs more robust. And overall, so Java becomes more expressive and performant, which is good in my book. Now, this is the vaguest of all timelines here. Uh, this is basically me guessing, but I really, really hope that next year we're gonna see some stuff, hopefully value, t value classes. And I'm pretty sure that I think it feels like value classes are pretty mature and then primitives as well. And uh, one of them is like just primitive classes as a preview. And the last one is that integer will become a primitive class as well. That's what JEP402 is about. Universal generics, I mean, it's just looking at this, this already seems too much. Like, I don't know. All in 2023 seems like too much. But what I want to point out is that specialized generics will probably be a little bit further down the road. I think that's the big one, and that will probably take a little bit longer. The, these articles, specifically the first two, are great. The Rotoval Halla and the language model, because they're not like written for JVM experts, so even I can understand them. They're really great. Just like check them out if you're interested in this at all. Brian does a great job at explaining this. There's like a crazy Venn diagram in there, which like takes alone like half an hour to study, but I figured it out and it's, it's pretty neat. Um, so yeah, give those a try and then there's more here. Okay, let's do a little ad break and breathe and do something else for a moment. Because it's not just, <laughs> I hear you laugh. <laughs> um, there's much more than just the big projects going on, right? This is something that Billy presented already, that as I said, the talk after this will present go into more detail so I can skip a lot of that. There's lots of APIs that are being added and, and, and improved. Um, just for one, for example, let's talk about Unix domain sockets. If you have two services running on the same machine and they need to communicate with one another, then chances are using like a loopback device to, uh, to do that. Um, which opens potentially up a security, but could be potential security vulnerability, but it's also not the fastest because it involves the entire stack, networking stack. Um, Unix domain sockets, which now also work on Windows, which is why um, Java could, um, could uh, use it, they use a file handle instead. 
So you can use five permissions. They can never be accessed from outside of the machine, and they are uh, much faster. So uh, that's the thing. For example, if you do inter-process communication on the same machine, look into Unix domain sockets as an alternative to just get better performance and better safety. We now have UTF-8 by default. We have a simple web server, which means that Java now has a command that's called jwebserver, and I can this is, this is actually a website that I'm running on the JWeb server. So there's a Java program there that just uh, uh, runs this, this little presentation here. NPEs give you better messages about not just oops null, but what exactly was null. Uh, tooling always improves, especially with JV, JVI event streaming and JDK 14, and not, that's not the only release, but there was one of the JV, JVI event streaming, JFI event streaming was a big one here. Uh, that's a cool improvement. So there's a lot of stuff like past 11 that's constantly being worked on. Uh, performance improvements, of course, that happens all the time. Security fixes. Sean Mullen works on that at an Oracle site. And I can recommend his blog. He's like clockwork, publishing one post exactly every six months, which is when the new Java release comes out. He writes a blog post, which is like, okay, these are all the things that we fixed. Look into that. Um, um, if perform uh, security is important to you, which I guess should be at least one person per project. We're also cleaning house. Things are getting deprecated. The top part is deprecated. It's not none of those are going to be out in are going to be removed in 19. But like 20 hours will make no promises. Security manager will probably be around for a while. Um, but like Apple API and bias locking, I would not give that a lot of time uh, before they are gone. And some things are already removed. So if you are in 11 and using a concurrent mark sweep, for example, or you really really need Nashorn, look into alternatives because they're already gone in the main line, so you can already not use them anymore. Let's skip the part where how to ease your migrations. Ask me later, because um, I do want to get to the poll that I did. So, okay, so I made these slides before, obviously. So can you see the results, by the way? Can you, in the app, see the results? Good, okay, that's good, because I have no way to show them to you otherwise. Um, so here are my guesses. Let's see whether they pan out. Oh, great, thank you, there are so many responses. Okay, so first thing, Java 11 is slowly but resolutely overtaking eight. Right? Good, next one. Adoption of 17 from 11 looks good. True. I mean, like 32 replies, is, that's like half of the Java 11 replies. We're going to get to that poll again. And that come, then now comes the most always using latest is uncommon but persistent. Thank you, whoever you three are, for making this true. Um, and then the other poll is, if your app runs on Java 11, do you have plans to update to Java 17 or plus? And that's interesting. So I gave you an option to, I, I just want to see the results. So we had 80 proper replies. 20 of those said, yes, we're going to update within the next three months. Another 13 within six months. Another 20 within 12 months. Only 25 out of 80 people said, like, nope, we're on 11 and we're fine with it. So that goes back to the adoption of, 11, of 17 from 11 looks good. So yeah, and I, we're happy with that. We're happy with that. Like, we, I would like the last point to be much, more, much stronger. But other than that, I think that's really good. Yes, 8 to 11 was a bump, but I think most people made that bump by now. And I uh, arrived in the future. And if for nothing less, then for Project Loom. So that's the last topic I have for you. Let's see how far we can get before they take away my mic. Um, you will have to wrestle it for me. I'm just saying. Um, so Project Loom deals with JVM features and APIs for supporting easy-to-use, high-throughput, lightweight concurrency. That's one big thing. And new programming models. That's another thing. So there are two big topics. Let's start about, talk about the first one. Oh, by the way, yeah, it was launched in 2018 only. So only a couple of years. So Ron Pressler has done an impressive job here. Let's talk about this hypothetical HTTP request that enters your, uh, your system. Uh, you want to interpret that, right? Parse some JSON probably, do stuff like that. And let's say you want to create the database. That's a blocking call. You wait for the data to come back. You process it, stuff it into the response, send it out. Nice. So how well are you utilizing your resources, or your JVM resources, that is? Well, step one and three, pretty good. You're busy, right? CPU is busy, like putting strings together and taking them apart. That looks nice. And then the query of the database where you block, it's just, nope, the JVM doesn't do anything there. So how would you implement that? The synchronous approach is to align J the JDK's unit of concurrency, which is, which is one thread. You want to do several things at once. The JDK can give you several threads at once. And then you take your unit of concurrency, which is like many requests, and say, like, look, let's just make one thread, one request. That's simple to write, simple to debug, simple to profile. You block on certain calls, but that's just the way it is. But the problem is that the number of these threads, and now we're going to start calling them platform threads, which is the actual operating system threads, they are limited, potentially. You can, you can have thousands, you can have tens of thousands, but you're not going to have more on most machines. 
And that's a problem because that is a limited resource and you're not using it well if you're sitting there waiting for the, for the database. So that's one of the reasons, not the only reasons, but one of the reasons why asynchronous programming entered the stage and I was like, you know what, we have a revolutionary idea. Let's only use this expensive resource when we actually need it. Uh, so use non-blocking APIs throughout the entire stack, for example, futures or reactive streams. The thing is here that you have to learn a new API to write, but also debugging and profiling is not that easy anymore. You can't just like set breakpoints easily to, or you can just, you can set breakpoints, but you cannot easily like then step into the next call because the next call might be asynchronously executed somewhere else. So um, it's hard to profile to see what each individual call that you have in the system, um, what different kind of tasks it spawned and how they relate. And it's incompatible with synchronous code. If you have some synchronous a library somewhere in your stack that doesn't know about this, that's not great because then we'll start blocking all these expensive threads. But if you do pull it off, you get much better resource utilization and high throughput. But that's, uh, that's again a decision you have to make between simplicity and performance in, in, the, in the sense of more performance with more throughput here. And always these conflicts lead to tension. It leads to you, make, you get potentially make the wrong decision and just say, no, I want to write the simple code, it's better to maintain and then it hurts you um, financially, for example, or you say, no, no, we need the throughput uh, and you optimize for that and then it turns out you waste way too much time implementing that because you don't have the number of users. And virtual threads, they want to remove that conflict. So virtual thread is a regular thread, like this strange font here is my code font. It is an instance of the class thread. Specifically, it's the instance of a private subclass, but never mind, it's a thread. It has super mem low memory footprint, just a number of kilobytes of bytes. Very small switching cost, so it's easy to, cheap to switch between them. And the reason for that is it's not scheduled by the operating system. It's scheduled by the Java runtime. So the Java runtime can, can make much more assumptions about what's going on and doesn't need to be as defensive as the operating system. And while they are waiting, they don't use an OS thread for that. So how does that black magic work? Um, it's somewhat straightforward, actually. Like on a high enough level, it's almost simple. So the idea is that you have a thread pool of so-called carrier threads. These are the actual operating system threads that are doing stuff. And then your virtual thread is mounted onto a carrier thread when it does something. And when it blocks, the JDK notes, oh, you're blocking? You're not blocking the carrier thread. Instead, I'm going to take the virtual thread and unmount it from the carrier thread, park it somewhere, this blocking thing, and take the carrier thread, give it back to the pool, and then some other virtual thread can run on that. So conceptually, that's pretty simple. The implementation wasn't quite that simple, but that's just technically how it works. So uh, this hypothetical uh, request from earlier, with virtual threads, when the request comes in, uh, the runtime would submit the task to the carrier thread pool and would be busy, and when it blocks, the thread yields, the JDK unmounts it and hands the carrier thread back. Now it does something else. You're blocking in number two, but you're not wasting any resource. You're just sitting there waiting for free, basically. And uh, when two unblocks, the runtime resubmits the tasks, and you're going to compete, uh, com continue computing. This is a funny but pointless example. What I'm doing here is I'm creating a million, one million threads. Anyway, so I'm creating one million threads that all sleep for a couple or for a second. And the joke here is that that virtual threads can can sleep at infinite throughput, which is not you know not very applicable to you. But I want to challenge you and do that with a non-virtual thread and create a million of those on your machine and see how that goes. Um, there's another example here, but I'm running out of time. Um, one interesting thing is to understand that virtual threads are not like magic performance pixie dust that just makes everything faster. What it gives you is, if your limiting resource is the number of threads, then virtual threads will remove that bottleneck. You might run into the next bottleneck after like 5% performance improvement if you're in a bet. That, that, just, that just what happens. So it's not like it's gonna make everything magically faster. Each task is gonna take the same amount of time, of computing time. It's just gonna allow you to run more of them at the same time. Okay. Talking about time, I'm out of that. Uh, so we cannot look into structured concurrency, which is like a, a big thing. That's something really cool that you can do with virtual threads. And as for all of these, I have at the end, look, so much more good content. I li this is actually like a 60 minute talk, so that's why I have to skip a few things, but I still wanted to show it to you. So the timeline for JDK 19 is, uh, sorry, sorry, the timeline is that in JDK 19, virtual threads and structured concurrency already preview. You can already start using them as a preview today. JDK 19 isn't out, but you can get an early access build. Um, and I'm pretty sure there will be more structured concurrency APIs coming in some time. Lots of links to check out to, to learn more about this uh, on parallelism and concurrency, something that Ron Pressler wrote that's not directly related, but indirectly and very interesting. I can already recommend that. And with that, I want to thank you very much for your attention and for being here. Let's, sorry. <laughs> Thank you.
<laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so uh, you can uh, find me. I'm, I'm NipahFX on all the platforms. Uh, but also, I'm working for the platform team, uh, for Java platform team at Oracle, and we write inside.java, which is exactly this kind of stuff. If that's interesting to you, look at inside.java. Dev.java is more like a, the, uh, the documentation front end that you can look at a bunch of these things as well. I wrote a book about the module system, and nobody cares about that. Uh, I'll say, yeah, I'll see you around the conference. Come up with your questions. We have plenty of time now. There's no talk planned right after this. So thank you very much. <laughs>